Today we're going to talk about a famous problem in the history of mathematics that computers have played an integral role in the treatment of over the years. So the problem falls into the general topic of graph coloring, so we're going to start off by warming up with a graph coloring problem. So consider this problem. Once upon a time, in the Far East, there lived a prince with three sons. These sons were to inherit the kingdom after his death, but in his will, the prince made the condition that each of the three parts into which the kingdom was to be divided must border on every other. After the death of the father, the three sons worked to find a division of the land that would conform to his wishes. Can you help them out? So take a minute, pause the video, and try and draw up some kind of solution. And once you've decided whether it's possible or not, and you have what you think is a solution, then keep on going and moving forward. So now we're going to add another son. So it's the same problem again, but now there are four sons trying to split up this piece of land. So again, pause the video and try to draw this out and see if you can come up with a solution that will work for the sons and meet the father's demands. So hit pause, do that now, and when you're ready to move on, then go on and start it again. What if there were five sons? So again, adding another son, it's the same problem. So once again, we need to divide a plot of land into five sections, all of which border every other section. So again, pause the video, try to decide whether you think this is possible or not. And once you've made a decision, if you think it's possible, you've come up with some kind of configuration that works, or if you think it's impossible, you have some kind of reason why you think that, then go on and start the video again, and we'll continue moving forward. So this problem with the five sons is actually the Mobius Weiss problem, or puzzle, um, that was put forth in 1840. And uh, Mobius is a German mathematician who's pretty famous, and Weisks is one of his buddies who actually just came up with this problem. Um, and so they put this forth, published it, and it became a fairly famous problem that a lot of people started trying to solve. At this point, you're probably thinking, this isn't math. It doesn't look like the math that you've seen before. And it also, graphs, graphs, this doesn't look like it has anything to do with graphs either. And I said that this was going to fall into graph coloring, so it should have something to do with graphs, and it should have something to do with coloring. So what's it got to do with coloring? Well, we're going to going to get around to that, but in the meantime, think about what you might think the answers to these questions are. So we're going to talk about Francis Guthrie for a little bit. He was a South African mathematician and botanist, and he put forth something called the four color conjecture in 1852. And this four color conjecture was that any map in the plane is four colorable. But wait, a conjecture? What's that? Well, a conjecture is something that we think is true as mathematicians, so we put it out there. It's kind of the mathematician's version of a hypothesis. So we put out this conjecture, and we say, we think this might be true, but we're not sure. And so that's what Francis Guthrie was doing by making this statement. He said, I think this is true. I put it out there to other mathematicians and see what they think. So what do you think? Is it true? So naturally the word map takes us to cartography. At the time they were particularly interested in being able to print a map of the counties of England and use the minimal number of colors to color the map so that no two neighboring counties were the same color. This is a desirable thing on maps, and it's a practice that's used still on maps today 
to try and have neighboring regions that we want to distinguish between be different colors so that you can see the boundary very easily. But it's expensive to print in color, especially at this time period. And so minimizing the number of colors that you need to use is ideal. And so this four color conjecture was big for cartography in that they would be able to potentially know how many colors maximum they needed to have to be able to print a map of anywhere. So being on the plane meant that it was a two dimensional map. So any paper map is a map on a plane and four colorable meant that you would need at most four colors to color that map so that no two boundary regions or bordering regions would be colored the same color. So people who kind of played at this in the cartography realm were Augustus de Morgan, who was an English mathematician and logician, uh, William Rowan Hamilton, an Irish mathematician, astronomer, and a physicist, and Arthur Cayley, a British mathematician. So some of these names are probably sounding a little bit familiar to you, and that's because they have done some huge things other than playing around with this problem. But it was Alfred Bray Kemp, an English mathematician, who actually came along and proved the four color conjecture in, on July 17th, 1879. And as such, the four color theorem is born. But wait, what's a theorem? So a theorem in mathematics is a conjecture that has been proven. So it's a statement that we weren't sure if it was true or false, and then we came along and we proved it by going through a series of logical steps that showed that it must be the case that that statement is true. So once it's been proven to be true, we call it a theorem instead of a conjecture. So now we have the four color theorem. But there's this thing about mathematicians. Not only do we like to know that things are true, we like to prove things in the most eloquent way. We like it to be beautiful. Mathematicians have this aesthetic thing that they're looking for. And Kemp's proof was not beautiful. So there became this next idea that can we make it more beautiful? Can we simplify the proof? Can we make it not be pages upon pages of things that are just gross to read? So William Edward Story, an American mathematician, got involved in that. And he proved, uh, proved the theorem in a slightly more beautiful way. And not to be outdone in simplifying and beautifying his own proof, Alfred Bray Kemp came back into play and proved it or published another proof that was much nicer to look at than his original. And then Peter Guthrie Tate, a Scottish mathematical physicist, he came along and he actually gave an even nicer proof. But people still weren't really satisfied with the proof that was given. And so the headmaster's challenge became a thing. So the headmaster of Clifton College in England published in the Journal of Education on January 1st, 1887, this challenge. So it said, in coloring a plain map of counties, it is of course desired that no two counties which have a common boundary should be colored alike, and it is found on trial that four colors are always sufficient, whatever the shape or number of the counties or areas may be. Required, a good proof of this. Why four? Would it be true if the areas are drawn so as to cover a whole sphere? Now, the headmaster here actually posed some incredibly great questions, and some of them extend beyond the original four color theorem, and some of it is just really asking for a better, more approachable, nicer proof of the four color theorem. This challenge was so popular that even the Bishop of London participated, and his proof was published by the Journal of Education on June 1st, 1889. Now I put proof in quotation marks there for a reason, and we'll get to that in just a bit. So Percy John Haywood it was a British mathematician who was only 29 years old at the time. He saw the headmaster's challenge, and he participated, but then he looked into things, and rather than actually 
proving it, he found issue with the existing proof. And he wrote, the present article does not profess to give a proof of this original theorem. In fact, its aims are rather destructive than constructive. For it will be shown that there is a defect in the now apparently recognized proof. And he was right. The myth was busted. So it's no longer the four color theorem because there's a problem in the proof. So all of these people have put forth and published proofs that are all wrong. So mathematics requires taking steps sometimes and trying something and potentially even publishing what you think is correct. And sometimes it's not. So let's learn a little bit from these people who did this. So what did happen to all of these players? Well, Alfred Bray Kemp, he became the president of the London Mathematical Society, so clearly the other mathematicians in England were not too upset about his incorrect proof. William Edward Story, and he became the first chair of the math de mathematics department at Clark University. At the time, Clark University was the premier mathematics department, basically, in the United States. So, also, wasn't really faulted much for this. And Peter Guthrie Taint, well, there's physics chairs in university buildings all over Scotland that are named for him. So, again, not too shabby. And Frederick Temple, this is the Bishop of London who participated and published his proof. He became the Archbishop of Canterbury, so not a bad outcome for him either. And what about Haywood, this guy who disproved all of it? Well, we haven't heard the last of him. And Guthrie, well, along with his brother Frederick, they actually proved that no finite number of colors is sufficient to color any three-dimensional space which is an interesting thing in and of itself as well. And this one has stood the test of time. So successful proof out of them. And the four color, whatever this thing is now, well, we're gonna fast forward 90 years. So Kenneth Apple, an American mathematician and Wolfgang Teichen, a German mathematician, joined forces with John Cook, a Canadian programmer, and with the use of 1,200 hours of fast mainframe computing, we had a four-color theorem again. Now keep in mind, this is the 1970s, so 1,200 hours of fast mainframe computing time is different than it would translate to today, but it still is not insignificant. But with that, and with the programming that went into it, we have a four color theorem again. It's been proven true. And the way they proved it true was they basically tested all of the cases. They went through this series of, of exhaustion of possible configurations that a map could have. And that is very dissatisfying to mathematicians. It's incredibly helpful for us to know if it's true or not. So having that, yes, it's true, is helpful. But in mathematics, we care about two things when we're looking at a conjecture. We care about whether it's true or not. But then if it is true, or even if it's not, we want to know why that is. So why is it true? A good proof will actually show you the steps along the way to explain to you why this statement is true. And if it's false, a good way of disproving it is to show examples of when it doesn't work or to be explaining why it can't possibly work. So in this case, we were proving that it's true, but what we've got is this computer program that just tested all the cases and said, well, it can't be false. And so that that's dissatisfying. So Paul Erdős is a very famous mathematician, and in 1979, he said, the most famous conjecture of graph theory, or perhaps of the whole mathematics, the four-color conjecture, became recently the theorem of Apple and Hagen. Now, Erdős, pretty satisfied. Erdős is very famous, so there's people who are satisfied because Erdős is satisfied. 
But then again, is it actually proven? Again, mathematicians not all satisfied with the type of proof we have here. So even as recently as 2007, the Oxford English Dictionary had an entry in it for the four color problem. The as yet unsolved problem of proving as a mathematical theorem that on any plane map, only four colors are needed to give different colors to any regions that have a common boundary. So the Oxford English Dictionary disagrees with Erdős, which is an interesting thing. So what do you think? Is it proven? Is it enough to just know whether it's true or false? Or do you also want to know why? Well, Pablo Picasso, not a mathematician, <laughs> said computers are useless. They can only give you answers. And one did here. They gave us an answer, but they didn't explain why. In 1993, we have a quote from Paul C. Kanan that was to reject the use of computers as what one may call computational amplifiers would be akin to an astronomer refusing to admit discoveries made by telescope. In 1991, Erdős came out again and said, I would be much happier with a computer free proof of the four color problem, but I am willing to accept the Apple Hagen proof. Beggars can't be choosers. So again, it's better to know whether it's true or not than to not know that even. So in 1998, Thomas Sadi said, interest in the four color conjecture seems not to be high in the math literature because it is now thought to have been proven or something. So again, mathematicians still to this day, not necessarily accepting of the proof of this theorem. So, Remember the headmaster's challenge? Well, like I said earlier, it turns out he asked some really good questions. Why four? He was asking for the mathematical proof without computer because in the day there was not a computer. But why four is an important question in mathematics that could give us insight into other things. If someone ever proved this without a computer and came up with the why, it could open up a whole realm of other understanding of other problems. Right? So that question still unanswered for the headmaster's challenge. And then would it be true if the areas are drawn so as to cover a whole sphere? It's another good question. We don't live on a piece of paper, right? We live on a sphere. So can we take a globe that's maybe more accurately representative of the space we live in and color it with just four colors. And getting a little more abstract, what if it was a donut shaped object? What if we looked on a donut? Could we color it with four colors? Well, Haywood's back again. So, Remember, I told you he'd be back. This is the guy who disproved the original proof of the four color theorem. So he's back again, and we're going back to 1890 because he's clearly not seeing all of this. He gave the conjecture for a given genus G greater than zero, the minimum number of colors necessary to color all graphs drawn on an orientable surface of that genus, or equivalently to color the regions of any partition of the surface into simply connected regions is given by this equation here. So at this point, you're probably saying, I don't know what a genus is, I don't know what an orientable surface is, I don't know what simply connected is, and that equation looks gross. And if you're thinking all of those things, you're not alone. Probably everyone else watching this is too, and it's okay. So this actually became the Ringel's Young Theorem. Haywood's conjecture was proven in 1968 by 
Gerard Ringel and Ted Youngs. They were German and a math American mathematicians. So again, it's the same exact statement because that was it was correct. They proved it to be true. And again, this one stood the taste test of time, though not so much time has passed since 1968 as the previous one. Um, so let's take a look at genus one. All right. So if G equals one and see if we can figure out maybe what genus means based on all of this. So if we plug in one for G, then we get seven plus the square root of one plus 48, so that's 49, square root of that, seven, so seven plus seven is 14, divided by two is seven, we're gonna take the floor of that. That's what the little, yeah? So floor of seven is seven, it basically just means round down. So we're gonna round down and we get seven. Well, genus, don't know what it means still from that, huh? All right, so genus is actually the number of holes in a surface. So a piece of paper has genus zero, a sphere has genus zero. And so when Haywood made this conjecture, what he was really doing was saying, you know what, this has been hard to do on a piece of paper. And so I'm just going to ignore that case and see if I can come up with what I think it must be for larger cases um, where it's a weirder surface. So genus one is really truly like the surface of a donut. And orientable means basically you know which way is up and which way is down. Um, again, uh, like the surface of a donut. There's no weird twists happening in it. And simply connected just means that you can walk from one point to another. Again, like on the surface of a donut. So this with genus one really is telling us that if I wanted to color anything I could possibly draw on the surface of a donut, or like a swimming inner tube, any design I could make on a swimming inner tube, so that no two regions that neighbor each other are colored the same way, that I would need seven colors. And you actually can come up with a way that you do need all seven colors to color the surface of a donut. So that's my challenge for you, is to see if you can come up with the way that there's a design on the surface of a donut that you truly need all seven colors. So that's basically the equivalent going back to our warm-up problem of having seven sons living on a donut and they have to divide the land up so that each of them is neighbors with all of the other sons. How can they all share borders? So. Good luck in trying that. I look forward to seeing what your solutions are.